Hello everyone, welcome to yours and my favorite part of the week. That's right, it is your online adulthood and aging course, and I'm here to walk you through the hottest topics in adult development. This week we're going to kind of look at uh, constructs and concepts that I want you to keep uh, in mind moving forward uh, as we work through the book. These constructs and concepts will be uh, quite relevant. So we'll just kind of uh, lay out some uh, uh, a foundation uh, that we can use uh, moving forward. All right, so let's jump into this. So as I stated, some of this is going to be kind of really definition uh, definitional based and kind of construct based, but you know, we got to walk through this. So let's begin, uh, beginning with kind of just a basic definition of developmental psychology. Uh, developmental psychology can be defined as the field of study that deals with the behavior, thoughts, and emotions of individuals as they go through various parts of the lifespan. Adult development can be defined as changes that take place within individuals as they progress from emerging adulthood to the end of life and empirical research scientific study of observable events that, that uh, we measure and are evaluated objectively. So really across all psychology, which I'm sure you know by now, that um, different schools of thoughts have different definitions. There's really not a lot of agreements even on basic fundamental uh, uh, definitions, but this is going to be our operational uh, definition of these terms moving forward. And I just want to make a couple key points here, and that's one, a development and specifically adult development. But kind of, again, more generally development, um, is uh, now understood to occur across the lifespan. That's why this course is kind of important because uh, kind of uh, traditionally, um, it was kind of argued that all oh, development is largely, uh, largely only takes place within a very narrow uh, uh, part of the lifespan, you know, early childhood or something along those lines, or maybe middle childhood or as a neonatal infant or something along those lines. But now we understand that uh, development occurs across the lifespan and thus it's important to um, uh, study adult development. And then secondly, empirical research, meaning empirical, literally meaning like you can see it, you can observe it. Um, that's We're going to re uh, review a lot of empirical research studies throughout this course, not just in my slides, but also uh, in our discussion posts. There are differences and commonalities across development. Inter differ individual differences uh, being those that, uh, aspects of the development that are unique to the individual and are not part of the whole group versus or uh, we'll just say verses here, uh, commonalities, aspects that are typical of adult life. What makes you, you? So kind of the idea here is that we have a, um, uh, a theoretical uh, innate, uh, quote unquote innate biological process wherein certain, th uh, certain stages or certain phases of development are thought to be universal. So for example, a one-year-old is not gonna be as tall as a 25-year-old. A uh, one-year-old is not going to be as uh, proficient at mathematics as a, you know, 15-year-old. Uh, so kind of this idea that we have kind of these universal um, commonalities across development, but also individual differences emerge uh, throughout development. And this can be related to a whole host of things that are debated across development or uh, among uh, developmental scholars and other various social uh, scientist scholars of what aspects are most important, but some of those include various environmental factors such as parent interactions, uh, the amount of siblings you have, interactions with your siblings, your relationship among your parents' siblings, your extended family, the neighborhood you live in, the country you live in, the historical era you live in, what economic system is, is uh, present in your country and or state. Um, um, and also, obviously, um, uh, kind of genetic uh, differences. Uh, does someone have a, a predisposition towards uh, diabetes, for example? But as we know now, and we'll talk about in later courses, it's really kind of this uh, interaction between those environments and genetics that um, contribute to individual differences. But kind of broadly speaking, we have individual differences, we have commonalities uh, throughout development. Moving on to stability and core, stability, um, kind of define as, or you can kind of conceptualize it as a consistent core, uh, which is a constant set of personality traits, pre preferences, and typical ways of being, and change, typical, uh, typically slow and gradual movement in a pre predictable direction, things that make us different from our younger or older selves, moving, career change. So kind of the idea here is that we have stability across the lifespan and change across the lifespan. And again, there's kind of a debate on how stable those quote unquote consistent core is with, um, 
uh, various scholars arguing on one hand that these kind of personality traits or these preferences are kind of very constant throughout life and are these stable cores that, that make up an individual throughout their lifespan. Now, that doesn't mean that there's no change, but there are certain sets of, a, again, a core that uh, remains with someone throughout their lifespan. And again, that the degree of stability or the degree of fluidity uh, within those, um, for example, personality traits, preferences, typical ways of behaving um, are debated uh, among uh, scholars. And then we have, again, kind of change development <laughs> um, uh, and typically thought to be kind of uh, typical, slow and gradual movement in a predictable direction um, as stated. So kind of an easy one is just height, you know, growing a little every year. And so obviously you hit a certain age range and then you kind of peak. And then even when you get older, you um, uh, decline in height. But also other things uh, change, such as, uh, you know, your, your reading abilities, again, kind of uh, peaking uh, or uh, linearly uh, progressing uh, throughout the lifespan with um, possible declines later on in the lifespan due to various um, uh, psychological disorders or neurological disorders that we'll cover in this class. Continuing on with stability and change, um, and these are kind of some of the hot topics or the big debates uh, within uh, develop or developmental psychology, but then more specifically, and I'll call this developmental psychology because it kind of is, but really, you know, obviously we're focusing on adulthood and aging, um, but kind of the, the broader uh, developmental uh, research. So kind of adulthood development, obviously being under the umbrella of development. Um, so, uh, so again, kind of some of the big debate topics are, is development change gradual or abrupt? You get a little taller a year, a little better at rating, uh, versus one day your kid starts talking, Cont um, continuous, which is the prop a property or development that is slow and gradual, taking us in a predictable, uh, direction. Degree of change is more of something. Stages, parts of the lifespan where there seems to be no progress for some time, followed by an abrupt slash fundamental change and change in kind. And then we have typical versus atypical development, com typical being common to most people and atypical, not, not typical slash unique to the individual. All right, so kind of putting this all in English here. So we kind of have a debate here. Is developmental change uh, gradual or abrupt? So is it kind of like this slow linear process or all of a sudden you hit some um, age or, or phase of your life and then you kind of unlock these abilities? And kind of relatedly, is development continuous or or in stages? So kind of again, continuous being um, uh, development is believed to be uh, slow and gradual across all of lifespan, uh, including adulthood. And um, it's kind of you can conceptualize it as more of something. So better reading, more vocab knowledge. You'll see older adults having a larger lexicon and kind of ability to perform well on uh, things like uh, crossword puzzles, something along those lines. So kind of a slow accumulation and a gradual accumulation of knowledge leading to or contributing to, I should say, uh, differences in kind of um, abilities, skills and um, performance on various uh, develop, uh, psychological tasks and kind of just everyday behaviors versus a stage approach. Now this you can kind of conceptualize as, as a staircase with each kind of step, uh, again, kind of unlocking new abilities. So this is kind of a fundamental shift, a change in that person. Once you hit a certain age, you unlock kind of new abilities. And this is classically a uh, PHA model, which is, we're not talking about in this class, but for, you know, kind of connecting it to previous uh, courses you've taken. And again, kind of typical versus a typical development. So typical development occurring in all people. So kind of the idea of puberty, for example, puberty uh, being within a certain age range uh, versus uh, a, a, typical, a typical development. So maybe like a rare uh, neurological condition, something along those lines. Um, and again, kind of typical development, kind of going back to the puberty example, this is also kind of rooted in historical era. Uh, and uh, because um, for example, um, uh, the uh, period in which uh, puberty begins has changed uh, over the last 100 years uh, with puberty occurring earlier in, uh, than it was 100 years ago. So typical, the point of that being is that typical development can change and what is defined as typical uh, depends on the historical era. There's also uh, external versus internal change. External changes are changes that are visible and apparent to those we encounter. So weight change, hair loss, pregnancy across uh, adulthood aging, and internal changes, which are changes to ourselves that are not immediately apparent to the casual observer, such as relationships. 
and the change works bi-directional. So kind of, it's a little more straightforward here. So internal changes being a little more, uh, possibly uh, a little more abstract. So kind of the idea here is that as we develop, we have kind of changes in our relationships. Uh, we have a different relationship with our parents. Maybe we have different relationship with our friends or less friends or then um, kind of going back to the parent example. So how uh, the levels of dependability often change. The relationship uh, fundamentally changes often um, as um, uh, parents become um, uh, incapable or less capable of uh, performing everyday tasks. So therefore uh, the child will take on a kind of caregiving role. But kind of the idea here is you cannot in that case, I mean, you kind of can, but kind of that internal understanding of the relationship is something that you really can't see. So it's an internal change within yourself versus kind of an external change with age, something like gray hair or hair loss, for example. And these changes often work uh, bi-directionally. So for example, uh, pregnancy uh, and adulthood, uh, the, becoming pregnant, you know, depending on marriage or just cohabitation or just uh, an accidental pregnancy, for example, uh, will fundamentally kind of change the relationship between uh, the uh, the two individuals who are in that relationship. So you can kind of see here external changes kind of impacting internal changes. And that's what it means by di bi-directional, basically. Both of those uh, elements of change kind of interacting with each other to impact uh, developmental outcomes or change uh, of an individual. Moving on the types of change, because as you can see here, uh, there, uh, when someone asks you what your age is or what uh, even defining age is, um, not, uh, not that straightforward. Uh, so beginning with chronological age, uh, which is defined as the number of years that have passed since your birth, biological age, which is a measure of adult physical condition comparable to others of the same age, the psychological age, which is a measure of how an adult's ability to deal with an environment compares to others of the same age, uh, social age based on the expected roles a person takes on at a specific point in his or her, her life. And a functional age, which is a combination of the bio, psych, and social age, or how well does an adult function compared to others. All right, so let's walk through uh, some of these briefly. Chronological age being kind of straightforward. If you ask someone how old they are, that's just how long they've been alive. Biological age, a measure of adult's physical condition. So kind of the idea here is that... Um, a 50 year old uh, would be expected to have, you know, a certain range of cardio abilities compared to a 30 year old. If a 50 year old is like an elite athlete, like it's like Michael Jordan, <laughs> and he's in, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's still capable of, you know, pound, uh, you know, um, uh, easily uh, defeating like some random random person in a pickup game. You know, that person's biological age, Michael Jordan, is much lower than his chronological age, 50 years old. It's kind of a difference between that physical condition, that cardio, that uh, leaping ability, uh, being much younger, being much more like a typical 30-year-old than a 50-year-old. Uh, moving on to psychological age, kind of adult's abilities to deal with the environment. So kind of the idea here is the, the difference here is kind of like the, psych, uh, the psychological part. So before we talked about with biological age, the physical part of, of physical condition comparable, this is more of a psychological um, uh, comparison within a similar environment. So for example, you know, at X uh, age is some, some part of adulthood, eventually you have to you know, pay, uh, pay bills, you have to kind of problem solve, deal with work issues, relationship issues, etc. cetera. Um, but obviously some people perform better on that than others. And kind of the idea here is that people have different ability, uh, different levels of impulse control, problem solving, kind of like those psychological constructs that uh, contribute to their ability to perform well. So something like maybe a 21 year old who uh, has, uh, you know, uh, is, has a great relationship with uh, the spouse, with their spouse or uh, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, or their parents, or and or like ability to kind of um, uh, just problem solve kind of throughout their daily life versus someone who like for example can't I don't know can't stop buying the newest like spicy chicken sandwich. So they just like oh I gotta keep buying the spicy chicken sandwich and then they don't pay their water bill and then. Uh, they have no water in their house. Um, so kind of lacking those problem solving skills and kind of ability to control impulse, uh, input, input and uh, kind of impulse control, uh, I should say. Um, so kind of having low levels of impulse control, which contributes to an, uh, a lesser ability, a, rel a relatively lesser ability to perform the same types of tasks, such as paying your bills, uh, than another person. 
uh, within the same age or relative same environment. Then you have social age, uh, which is kind of the expectations of a person at a certain point of, in their life. So this is a little similar to psychology, but here are psychological age, but this is more kind of our social expectations for an individual. What do we as a society expect for that person uh, to be able to do at their given age range? So something like a, you know, a, a 23 year old, um, who has taken on a role as, uh, I don't know, pr a president of some university association. Maybe they're the leader of some local community group. They're also a parent. They're a single mom who works two jobs and they're kind of just like defying all, they're taking all these roles and they're performing exqu like exquisite on all the, you know, uh, uh, within uh, all these kind of social tasks. They're outperforming uh, the social expectations at their age. And then functional age is kind of like this entire, kind of like this combination of all of those together. So it's kind of like just how well does a person perform across the board? That can be physical, um, psychological, and social. It's kind of like this, combining it all together and just saying, okay, in totality, what is the functional ability of this person? Next, we're going to discuss three sources of change, normative age-graded influences, normative history-graded influences, and non-normative life events. Beginning with normative age-graded influences, uh, these are, uh, this is defined as influences that are linked to age and experience by most adults as they grow older. Uh, biological clock, which is defined as patterns of change over adulthood in health and physical functioning. You don't have puberty at 47. Shared experiences, the social clock, which is a person's sense of when things should be done and when he or she is ahead of or behind the schedule dictated by age norms. Off-time events may negatively affect development. Ageism, discrimination against those who are in later or earlier periods of adulthood. So kind of the idea here is that these are more, these are normative. These are thought to be, you know, quote unquote universal or universal with, or you know, maybe just applicable to a contest, but kind of in general here, is, these are universal changes. Uh, across humans, across cultures, um, and that are linked to age and experience. So, for example, biological clock, you have certain health and physical functioning at certain ages. So, kind of, again, uh, the idea here is that, in general, uh, a one-year-old baby is not going to have type 2 diabetes, but maybe a 60-year-old is far more likely to do so. A one-year-old baby is not going to be 7 feet tall. They're going to be, you know, they're not going to be 6 feet tall. They're going to be uh, shorter than a 50-year-old. And it's kind of the same thing at uh, puberty. So these are, again, kind of universal changes linked to age and uh, experience. Now, relatedly, we have these shared, exper uh, shared experiences. So, and the idea being that we all have kind of like this internal social clock, uh, wherein we have kind of an understanding of when things are supposed to be done and at what uh, ages. So we have a certain idea that at college, you know, you go to... Um, uh, you attend college at a certain uh, uh, time within your life, you know, early 20s or whatever. Um, you have kids within a certain time. You have uh, whatever, you buy a house at a certain time, something along those lines. And if you aren't meeting kind of that internal uh, expectations those in, that are, that are uh, dictated by this uh, uh, shared social experience, this social clock, those social expectations, within your environment, then um, you can feel bad. <laughs> and there's, you know, thought to be kind of negative developmental consequences uh, linked to understanding that you're kind of underperforming compared to your peers at your own age. On the other side, if you're overperforming, so whatever you're, uh, you know, if you have a PhD at 17 years old, you're, um, you know, you're financially stable at 18 years old for, for whatever reason. Um, then uh, you're ahead of schedule and then you feel good about yourself and it's you know possibly linked to positive aspects of development. Now obviously there is a lot of variations in that and it's related and you know speaking of kind of home ownership and attending college are related to um, historical eras and um, the sp a, a specific cultural context. But uh, even then, with the kind of with that understanding, people still do have a kind of uh, an understanding of again the social that that that, in, that social clock that understanding. I should be doing this, or it's expected of me to be at you know X achievement at this at Y age, and I can say you know that's bullshit or not. But we have that understanding, and it's not to be or and it's it's theorized that uh, you know being ahead 
or uh, behind uh, in uh, kind of meeting those expectations has uh, links to developmental outcomes. Now moving on to history graded influences. These are effects uh, connected to historical events and conditions that are experienced by everyone within a culture at that time. It's helpful explaining both the similarities found among people within certain groups and also the dissimilarities among people in those same groups. Cultures are a large social environment in which development takes place within a shared context. People within a given culture are exposed to many of the same cultural ideas, and they, uh, so they tend to share uh, similar beliefs, practices, and so forth that make them all part of a, uh, the same culture. Uh, examples include expected age of marriage, typical number of children, roles of men and women, parenting practices, collectivism, and interdependency. Cohorts are a group of people who share a common historical experience at the same stage of life. Glenn Elder, who's kind of this famous developmental psychologist, uh, found the cohort of teenagers during the Great Depression showed fewer long-term effects uh, than those who had been uh, uh, in early uh, uh, elementary school at the time. Younger cohorts spent a larger portion of their childhood under conditions of economic hardship, and the hardship altered family interaction patterns, educational opportunities, some negative effects detectable in adulthood. Kind of a mouthful, right? But kind of what, we're, what the takeaway message here is that we all live within cultures. Uh, we all live within uh, various countries, uh, various states, various cities, etc. And within those areas, is those geographic areas, and also kind of... Um, um, also like um, cultural connections. So somebody like who's a refugee or working overseas, et cetera, they're still connected to kind of that original culture in some way um, in general. Um, but kind of the idea here is that uh, within that geographical er uh, area uh, and or kind of um, cultural connection uh, to a group, um, you're going to be exposed to and experience similar kind of um, environmental conditions. So those can be positive and negative. So, for example, you live in Florida, you, um, you, um, you live in uh, Panama City, and they got uh, semi-recently were hit with a large hurricane. That, that's a kind of collective shared environmental uh, trauma, a, um, a historical event that uh, was collectively shared uh, by uh, individuals within an environment. Now, of course, different individuals within that environment have different resources, different financial resources, different social resources. So therefore, you know, they can move, they can rebuild their house, they can depend on other people for uh, social support. So kind of speaking to the similarities and dissimilarities within a given area, they were all exposed to that hurricane, which for example, uh, I don't know, North Dakota did not experience that hurricane. So you have kind of that cultural, uh, uh, difference due to a historical event affecting Florida, but not North Dakota. But you also have uh, dissimilarities uh, within the Floridians, uh, those people who live in Panama City, because they have different resources that they're bringing to the table. And then also kind of just in general, within a given area or kind of, again, kind of a connection to a culture, you have uh, various expectations of marriage, the number of children, what your uh, parenting practice is going to be, what kind of job you're going to have, etc. Uh, how you view the world uh, and those kind of uh, environmental conditions obviously are going to impact development. And this totality, these historical events, these conditions um, are, are going to shape uh, uh, developmental outcomes as stated. And uh, one example, as I reviewed, is this elder study. So kind of the idea here is that cohorts who of teenagers who were exposed to the Great Depression, obviously <laughs> a lot of adversity during that time, um, they uh, would expect to have kind of different developmental impacts than a generation of teenagers who were not exposed to kind of similar levels of uh, adversity or economic adversity. And what Elder found was that teenagers were, were uh, less likely to show uh, long-term negative developmental uh, outcomes as compared to children who grew up in the Great Depression. So kind of the idea here is that the child, you know, say they're five years old, they are spending their you know, X, uh, their entire childhood basically in the Great Depression. So really these formative developmental years, this cumulative effect of a kind of a sensitive period of development contributing to, um, or I should say these formative years, um, uh, this sensitive period of development 
um, interacting or being influenced by the Great Depression for a long period of t a longer period of time uh, uh, compared to a teenager. So for we'll just say a 17 year old versus a five year old, a 17 year old is going to probably have more um, uh, kind of problem solving skills, uh, better uh, financial stability, um, just uh, more kind of resources in general. Uh, and I have also developed in a, uh, you know, the previous 17 years in her life, uh, developed in, a, in conditions that weren't the Great Depression. So we're not exposed to that uh, Great Depression, you know, environmental, that, that environment uh, throughout their entire um, life versus a five-year-old or whatever, three-year-old who is going to grow up basically their entire life in the era of the Great Depression slash, you know, kind of still recovering from the Great Depression. So kind of that accumulative uh, effect impacting uh, developmental outcomes and then also um, kind of creating cohorts. So wherein uh, individuals, uh, groups of individuals sharing a common historical era at a specific stage of life. In that case, uh, uh, teenagers exposed to the Great Depression. And these are kind of uh, the traditional, uh, or traditional, uh, these are kind of thought to be uh, cohorts in the United States. And cohort analysis is kind of a little hacky, in my opinion. There's, um, uh, for example, uh, following the New Deal, we, have under we now know that uh, the distribution of kind of New Deal uh, programs were not distributed equally across races with uh, uh, Black Americans not receiving the amount of benefits as white Americans, but still they were kind of in that historical era. But it's just kind of important to keep in mind not to collapse everybody within that you know, cohort as kind of one monolith as um, there's a uh, the high level degree of variation. Um, in exposure to adversity, as stated before, with kind of the hurricane, you can just kind of just, if you're rich, you know, or have you know a higher class, uh, you can just fly away from the hurricane and rebuild your house. Um, so, kind of race, disability, uh, uh, sex, uh, uh, gender, uh, class, all impacting kind of um, in, in producing variability within cohorts. But still, kind of this is our kind of cohort model. And finally, non-normative events. These are aspects that influence one's life that are unique to the individual. Events, quote, on time are easier to cope with. Death of a spouse, winning the lottery, hit by a car. Okay, so kind of the idea here is that you, we already talked about you live in this culture. You also have these kind of normative development, developmental changes, but also you have these unique um, influences in an individual's life. So you can be a Floridian, but then hit the lottery, for example. That's a unique experience that, that, only, that in general, most people are not going to uh, experience and uh, kind of uh, create a, kind of a unique developmental trajectory. But also um, uh, looking at kind of more adverse uh, events, uh, death of a spouse. So there's a, there's a, a large difference socially and developmentally between losing your spouse at 100 years old versus losing your spouse at 30 year, 30 years old. Those are going to affect an individual differently differently because of you know the expectation that an uh, uh, individual is not going to die at 30 years old versus 100 years old, and those kind of that adversity that non-normative event um, would be expected. Um, to contribute to a higher um, risk of that individual of losing their spouse at 30 years old, having kind of uh, worse developmental outcomes. They're at risk of, of having worse developmental outcomes um, compared to someone who loses their spouse on a normative timeline. Moving on to genetics, environment, and their interactions. Behavioral genetics can be defined as a scientific study of the extent to which the genetic and environmental differences among people are responsible for differences in development. Heritability is the percentage of the variability in a trait across individuals that is due to genes. Some traits are thought to be highly heritable, such as height, while others are not, such as religious affiliation. Height among plants may be largely heritable, um, heritable I should say, uh, but watering those plants and environmental manipulation can result in substantial increases in their heights. High heritability does, doesn't imply unchangeability. So specific uh, uh, hereditary markers have been found to be correlated with cognitive abilities, physical characteristics, and personality characteristics. So kind of the idea here is behavioral genetics, kind of uh, the idea here is that they're trying to, or behavioral geneticists are attempting to uh, identify uh, X percent of development uh, being the result of environmental factors versus Y percent 
of uh, some developmental outcome being a result of, of genetics. So it's kind of like a ratio. So X percent is environment, Y percent is um, genetics. And that's kind of like their goal here. Um, and uh, kind of the outcome of that is heritability. Again, the percentage of variability in a trait across individuals that is due to genes. And as, as, as stated, some uh, kind of traits or developmental outcomes are thought to be more heritable than others, height. Uh, but even then, um, there, uh, even within those highly heritable uh, conditions, such as height among plants, environmental manipulation, such as water in them, exposure to sunlight, can increase their heights. So this idea that so heritability should not be conceptualized as this unchanging kind of set in stone um, trait that is kind of that locks somebody in. Uh, even uh, highly heritable kind of uh, developmental outcomes are still subject to environmental uh, manipulation and are influenced by environmental uh, manipulation, I should say. Twin studies, and this is a foundational component of behavioral gen uh, genetic research. So twin studies uh, determine whether identical twins are reared together or more similar to other uh, uh, more similar to each other than fraternal twins were together. So kind of the idea here is um, um, identical uh, twins uh, sharing 100% um, of their DNA versus uh, fraternal twins not sharing 100% of the, their DNA. Um, and then so basically what you can do is uh, these researchers can collect data on fraternal twins and identical twins and kind of follow them across the lifespan and then compare um, how similar the siblings are to each other. So you can compare how similar uh, someone is on um, a personality, whatever, some kind of personality test, for example. So you can measure personality in identical twins longitudinally, aka across their lifespan, and do the same with fraternal twins. You can then calculate how similar they are the, between each other, the two sets of siblings, and then compare how similar the, the identical twins are to the fraternal twins. And then based on that comparison, um, uh, use that comparison to kind of calculate the heredit, uh, hereditability of, in this case, personality. So using twin studies to identify um, the extent to which uh, a trait is uh, influenced or kind of uh, by genes. Some limitations of uh, this research uh, design include identical twins could be more psychologically similar because they shared prenatal environments. Some scholars argue that the prenatal environment is the most important predictor of future developmental outcomes. These studies do not account for the environmental impact, intergenerational life history, or genetic expression, or the genome. Identical twins are often treated similarly, and heritability technically says little or nothing about how malleable or alterable a trait is. Heritability is not a fixed number. So uh, kind of walking through some of these. Uh, so some scholars argue that the prenatal period is the most important period of development. Um, and uh, we'll talk about that in uh, later chapters. So kind of the idea here is that these um, uh, identical twins are sharing the same uh, prenatal environment. Therefore, this is kind of a shared environmental experience. Thus, that shared uh, uh, prenatal environment is uh, contributing to the developmental, uh, developmental outcomes. And thus, it's kind of being conflated with um, uh, uh, kind of um, genetic um, uh, influence. So kind of that prenatal environment uh, not being measured and is being attributed to um, uh, genetic uh, influence because it's, the prenatal environment is not being uh, measured. Uh, and because some scholars argue in developmental psychology that the prenatal environment is critical to long-term developmental outcomes, uh, the critique is that these twin studies are not capturing that measurement of prenatal uh, environments and then in fact kind of attributed to contributing, attributing uh, developmental outcomes to uh, genetics instead of prenatal development. It does not account for environmental impacts, intergenerational life histories as stated. So my research, for example, uh, in the Democratic Republic of Congo have looked at mothers, uh, kind of uh, adversity that they experienced throughout their life and, um, uh, and trying to connect that, connect that to um, their children's uh, developmental outcomes. And I've been myself and others have found um, evidence that that is the case. So kind of the idea here is that through the experience of a mother and a father, 
uh, kind of their environmental experience kind of changing them biologically and obviously socially and psychologically, which then contributes to developmental outcomes in their child. And that again is not measured in twin studies. Uh, identical twins are often treated similarly, thus again, kind of um, you make the uh, researchers may inadvertently be uh, attributing uh, genetics to developmental outcomes, wherein it's the kind of shared environmental experience uh, that may also be contributing to developmental outcomes. Heritability says little or nothing about how malleable the trait, uh, trait is, and it's not a fixed number. So again, kind of going back to that a plant example, even though that height is thought to be heritable, um, or plant height is thought to be highly heritable, still you have to water the plant, you have to provide good soil. And my research again in the Democratic Republic of the Congo has found that mothers exposed to um, uh, a wartime occupation gave birth to children who were shorter heights. So kind of, again, this heritability, even though it may be highly heritable, is still influenced by um, uh, the environment. And uh, kind of, again, sustaining heritability not being a fixed number. It, it's thought to be uh, behavioral geneticists are, uh, believe that or kind of approach their uh, research by kind of this ratio effect where an X percentage is again attributed to genetics, Y is uh, attributed to an environment and that kind of ratio, um, or I should say, however, that ratio can change again. So if you have, again, this plant example where we have two sets of plants and we don't do any environmental manipulation, any environmental differences in how we treat the plants, we would just, and then we notice differences, we would say, oh, this is a hundred percent, the differences in these plants are a hundred percent heritable uh, or due to uh, heritability or kind of some genes in the plants. How, um, because I didn't manipulate them. However, if I did manipulate them and they notice differences, then that percentage, that ratio the, uh, of, 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 of hereditability versus environment would change. So kind of the idea here is that this number is not, is not a fixed number. It's not static. And depending on the environmental inputs, that uh, ratio can change. It's not a fixed number. Moving on to the impassive environment on development across the lifespan. Lifelong effect of early family experience has been demonstrated. Parents who provide basic trust to their children instill a sense of self-worth, good coping skills, the ability to perform meaningful relationships, and a solid, solid foundation for a core values children will take through adulthood. The National Health and Nutrition Ex Examination Survey, for example, found that adults were asked, or I should say, uh, adults were asked about their depressive uh, symptoms from the survey. And at every age, those who lived in impoverished environments reported more symptoms of depression. So we're going to talk about this in later chapters, but kind of the idea here is that uh, speaking to kind of the gradual nature of development, um, once you hit a certain age, you don't kind of just magically unlock abilities, which are kind of just completely unconnected to anything you've ever experienced before. Uh, you, you've developed problem solving skills, coping skills, self-worth throughout your lifespan, and those kind of development impacts uh, later life age, and uh, adulthood and adolescence and older adulthood. Um, uh, relationships and uh, navigating the world and your uh, kind of mental health and um, yeah and other, other like core values and so for example impoverished neighborhoods impacting levels of depression across the lifespan so that's another example of of the environment kind of impacting uh, developmental outcomes across the lifespan not just at uh, at, uh, at a young age but also uh, adulthood and uh, older adults which again we'll talk about how uh, the stability and the influence of, of these kind of uh, environmental factors uh, throughout adulthood in later chapters in this course. And then finally, you kind of have this interact uh, interactionist view, um, wherein epigenetic inheritance, which is the process in which genes one receives of a conception, are modified by subsequent environmental events that occur during the prenatal period and throughout the lifespan. Nature and nurture co-act uh, co to bring forth particular developmental outcomes. And DNA methylation, chemical process by which genes are modified in, in epigenetic inheritance, might explain differences in identical twins. And we'll talk about this uh, in uh, later chapters, but kind of the idea here is this process of epigenetics, wherein the environment and genes kind of interact with each other. So for example, a individual may be born with a predisposition towards impulsive behavior, uh, which can kind of manifest in drug use. However, it's only a predisposition. 
And the idea here is that, that in order for that gene kind of be activated, you can think of it kind of as like a light switch on or off, um, uh, kind of simple terms here. Um, uh, in order for that light switch to be turned on, some kind of environmental, adverse environmental factor has to occur. So, uh, you know, death of a parent or some kind of massive tragedy that happens, or maybe an accumulation of adversity throughout the lifespan, which, uh, which activates that, that uh, genetic predisposition for impulsive behavior and consequently drug use. Uh, and so, uh, and then, you know, producing uh, drug use behavior and that the negative developmental uh, output, uh, outcome, the drug abuse. So kind of this nature and nurture, uh, kind of co-acting to influence developmental outcomes across the lifespan. And one method by which that this happens is through, through DNA, DNA method, methylation, um, um, which as stated is kind of biological process by which this occurs, but this also might explain differences in identical, identical twins. So kind of the idea here being that yes, both twins may be predisposed to X behavior uh, or Y negative developmental outcome. However, the twins may have uh, not be in the same room at all times, or maybe, you know, they're separated. So maybe sometimes one twin is exposed to more adversity than the other, or one twin is exposed to more protective factors than the other, thus activating or not activating some genetic predisposition for impulsive behavior, again, for that example, um, and, or even uh, growing uh, or throughout the lifespan. So maybe one uh, twin gets uh, married early, another one doesn't, or one gets lucky and gets a job and the other one doesn't, and one is poor and thus one is poor and one isn't, uh, you know, through their 20s or early 30s. And then so thus the poor uh, twin experiencing kind of uh, accumulation of of stress, of chronic stress uh, that the other twin is not exposed to, and thus that uh, trauma exposed, that chronically stressed uh, twin uh, activating that epigenetic process wherein their impulsive uh, predisposition is activated. So it's kind of just one proposed mechanism by which um, twin studies or twins um, may, uh, how twins differ, but also not just twins, but how uh, genes and environments uh, interact across the lifespan in individuals. Jumping ahead a little bit, I'm going to talk about seven features of uh, development across a lifespan. Uh, uh, the first being that uh, development is a lifelong process. Development in any period of life is best seen in the context of the whole lifespan. It's multidirectional. Different aspects of human functioning have different developmental trajectories and involves both gain and losses. Young does not mean gain and old does not mean loss. Can occur jointly. So kind of traditionally, we thought old age is just you know, being uh, performing just worse on everything and young just being nothing but gains. But we've now kind of better understand that's not the case. So for example, vocabulary increasing throughout the lifespan and even youth, um, um, uh, for example, um, uh, reading, for example, uh, in youth, uh, you, you kind of see, we kind of uh, intuitively uh, understand reading or the progression of reading abilities is kind of this linear process where an, an individual is better at reading each year of their lives. But that's actually not the case. Um, it's actually rather kind of a quadratic relationship, which means like it starts linear, that is uh, reading skills increase, but at a certain age, it kind of levels off or even a little decrease. And then reading goes, uh, abilities go back up again. And you can actually see uh, demonstrations of this uh, with this figure on the right here, uh, on the right side of the screen, I should say. And this is a classic Stroop test, and this is basically measuring inhibition. And what you do here is you read, uh, researchers will present the, these words to um, uh, people across the lifespan. Uh, this is a, any, any age can take this test. And um, the experimenter will, will ask the participant, what is the color of the word? So obviously yellow is in red, and that's kind of creating a contradiction within our mind. Yellow should be yellow, not yellow being red. And what research demonstrates is that um, around middle uh, childhood, um, ch children perform worse on this task uh, than actually earlier uh, 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 younger children because uh, children at, at, in that middle uh, adulthood, or sorry, middle uh, childhood, becomes more automatic. You're really not thinking, you're not sounding out every word. It's kind of, you know the word and you're just automatically uh, saying the word. While at the same time, their inhibition uh, has not developed 
uh, at the same rate as a reading ability. So they have this automatic reading ability. Uh, you know, they just read the word, they don't have to sound it out, they know the word. So kind of an increased ability to um, an automation of reading combined with still kind of a very decreased inhibition, uh, contributing to more errors on this um, task. Well, compared to uh, you know a 40 year old who would uh, have higher levels of inhibition and perform better on this task and even compared to children even a little older. So again, speaking to different developmental trajectories of abilities, reading the automization and inhibition and uh, old not automatically uh, being linked to loss of abilities. You have higher rates of inhibition and you have, uh, for example, kind of as stated, kind of higher lexicon, for example, across uh, as you progress uh, into older adulthood. Continuing on these uh, seven features, uh, we have historical cultural context shapes development, which we've already talked about kind of with the Great Depression. We'll review a little more in detail in the next slide. Nature and nurture interact, again, speaking to the epigenetics, and development is best understood through interdisciplinary studies. Developmental psychology is everything. So um, a psychology, if we understand that um, the, your environment impacts uh, development, so the environment being your immediate environment, so your neighborhood, your um, your family interactions, but also like your state, your country, your historical era, the economics, the political system that you live in. These are obviously a whole wide range of different fields and thus uh, development uh, across the lifespan is best understood interdisciplinary and thus kind of why I'll be incorporating various studies uh, that kind of are interdisciplinary uh, throughout this course. And we'll discuss within our lectures, but also within our discussions. Historical changes. There are five traditional markers of adulthood. Completion of education, financial independence, leaving home, marrying, and having children. However, there are historical, uh, th these uh, uh, traditional markers are influenced by historical eras. So for example, World War II, jobs became more complex and required more education. Industrialization uh, increased and farming decreased. Um, in light of kind of those trends, uh, the labor force required new skills taught in schools, school became compulsory, and there were child labor laws, depression slash recession, out of work, demoralized fathers, less affection and perform worse in school, more problem behaviors, erratic careers, unstable marriages. Okay, so what are we getting at here? So we have these traditional five markers of adulthood as stated, but however, historical eras impact uh, those kind of traditional markers of development. So, for example, during World War II and industrialization and kind of a decrease uh, in uh, agrarian uh, work, we uh, changes occur within our culture and within our country, uh, within our laws and our economics, wherein um, uh, jobs now and, and these new industrial jobs require new skill sets, more training, more uh, kind of critical thinking, problem solving, thus you need a kind of laws to reflect those necessary, uh, uh, those laws to kind of um, uh, create abilities within your population that can perform those tasks. So therefore, um, make school compulsory. The school laws of the 19th century are far different than what they were now. Uh, the rates of college education are far higher. The rates of high school education are, are far higher now um, as compared to 150 years ago kind of due to these uh, shifts in the environment, these shifts in economics and politics and, and wars, and also uh, depression recessions. So for example, um, out of work, uh, say someone gets laid off, a father, for example, and then they become depressed and thus less affectionate. Um, and then as a result of, you know, or contributing to, um, or that uh, lack of affection with their children and their spouse, contributing to their children performing worse in school, having more behavioral problems, and then all of that kind of combined into create an unstable marriage and thus higher rates of divorce. So you can kind of see here that those five traditional markers are influenced by, again, industrialization, farming, the war, or depression. Um, those, those environmental factors, those, envi those historical changes uh, impacting uh, those five traditional markers of adulthood. And a classic example of a historical change, you know, uh, following the Great Depression, the New Deal, and you can see here uh, uh, from that point is from a book that I read. Um, you can see that uh, the impact of kind of these larger historical changes in these 
environmental shifts, but not just at the individual level, which is, you know, in general, what kind of Western psychologists focus on, but at these macro levels, these political, these economic levels. So you can see here that uh, New Deal legislation impacting the rates of suicide, aka influencing developmental trajectories of, of uh, psychological disorders. And this relates to, uh, or is foundational really, to uh, one psychologist uh, called Brenner, who you may be familiar with. Uh, he argued that scientists were studying human development out of context. Uh, he argues that development can vary widely depending on the neighborhood, uh, the home environment, or culture. He charged that uh, developmental psychology has become the study of strange behavior of children in strange situations with strange adults for the briefest possible periods of time. Period, people are embedded in a series of environmental systems which interact with each other and the, and the individual uh, over time to influence development. Changes arise from ongoing transactions in which a changing organism and a changing environment affect one another. So kind of the idea here is that he's saying, okay, listen, all these studies that you guys have, you're putting uh, adults and children in kind of this very controlled experimental context um, that is nothing like kind of how they experience the world. So this is a really like brand new circumstance that's really not reflective in the real world. And then kind of trying to draw these universal claims uh, based on these kind of uncontextualized um, uh, uh, experimental conditions. And also then drawing these kind of broad universal claims um, despite the fact that development uh, can, uh, can vary widely depending on neighborhood, environment, culture, historical era, etc. And not only that, but people are embedded in these environmental systems and which influence development. And we'll talk about those systems uh, right now. And these systems are, uh, are proposed by Bronfen Brenner. Um, uh, that basically he's arguing that you should, as uh, across a lifespan, uh, development across the lifespan, you should always consider these systems because uh, people develop within the context of these multiple, multiple environments and there are five proposed environments which are all listed here. And here's kind of a schematic of, these, of this model. And uh, Brofenbender again argues that a development will be complex because outcomes depend on many environmental factors. Will a parent losing a job be detrimental to a child? Maybe historical period is important. The relationship between environments and people change over time. So for example, kind of going back to that New Deal, uh, where we saw uh, rates of suicide decline within um, uh, Americans following New Deal legislation. So will losing a job in fact um, uh, increase uh, the likelihood of detrimental effects on a child or and or adult? Maybe, depends on what the protective factors are, depends on the historical era. Are there uh, social safety nets? Is there unemployment insurance? Is there social security? You know, prior to the, you know, uh, World War II, none of that existed. Social security, uh, unemployment benefits, or no social programs. So thus kind of the, the relationship between that, the environment, that stressor in the individual will differ by historical era. Um, Prof. Benner was dis disenchanted with comparing individuals, both children and adults, at different SES levels, and he proposed a PPCT model that is process, person, context, and time. So basically, what he's arguing again is stated: development differs across all these process, uh, across time, um, but also kind of classifying as development as negative and po or positive can be uh, can kind of depend at times uh, depending on the historical era or the context. Sometimes uh, what is seen as negative a ne negative developmental outcome in one context can be positive in another context. So for example, uh, maybe authoritarian parenting can be a positive uh, developmental um, uh, outcome or a developmental influence. A parent using again a parenting a parent using um, authoritarian style parenting being very strict can be a po can be positive for the parent and the child in a condition wherein you know a dangerous neighborhood you're in a war zone uh, and there's you know, danger everywhere so thus being very strict can be positive but maybe in a different setting it's less positive so over the course of environment or evolution and during individuals development genes and environments influence one another and co-act to increase decrease the probability of developmental outcomes and on the right hand side here you can see those five um, systems that I laid out on the previous slide. When microsystem uh, and uh, mesosystem kind of being the traditional Western understanding of psychology are really the focus. So those individual biological factors alongside school, kind of religion and peers. So kind of the family units and kind of individual genetic variability 
and and uh, psych- and uh, uh, psychological variability that is like uh, personality traits, for example. But also there are these other systems of development. We have these larger media, media, social, uh, social networks, workplaces, the economy, political systems, all occurring within a um, uh, historical era. So in this class, we're going to very much focus on expanding our understanding of psychology um, and development and adulthood to include these other larger systems of development. And you can even see here that uh, the, some of these factors exist in multiple systems. So schools, for example, are influenced by macro systems. So is a school funded? Is there a school lunch program? Those are all impacted by economics and political systems that are not controlled by your school or your immediate neighborhood, but you know, your state or your country. Strengths and weaknesses in Broffenbrenner's model? The strengths include conceptualizes development as a product of dynamic interactions between biological and environmental factors. Studies uh, demonstrate that traumatic events can disrupt multiple systems and considers the role of historical context in development. There are limitations, there are generalization problems. Uh, the findings typically uh, include, it depends, maybe. Do all developmental outcomes have the same degree? Maybe, and how do we measure this? So kind of some issues include uh, generalization problems. So can, uh, how often can we generalize these findings to universal a- uh, aspect, uh, you know, development? And uh, kind of relatedly, how do we measure this? How do we measure all these different environmental influences in one study? You, and the truth is you can't. So kind of how do best do you go about incorporating these multiple system models, but also understanding that, um, uh, that, uh, that researchers in general are trying to um, uh, generalize their findings to other populations, even if they aren't collecting data from every single uh, system or environmental system. Okay, moving on to research methods, we're gonna talk about three methods. Those include cross-sectional, longitudinal, and sequential. Beginning with cross-sectional, which is the most common um, form of experiment or method of, uh, of, of experiment design, um, uh, different groups are compared, data collected at one time per participant, one type of group is age, provides information about age differences. It measures the effect of age on an outcome variable, relationship between age and development, sight and height, for example, cohorts effects, effects of being born as a member of a particular generation in a particular historical context. All cross-sectional studies are designed to study different age groups or stages of life at the same point in time. All right, so translating this to English. So kind of the idea here is that um, in this research design, the all data is collected at kind of one time each participant has their data data collected one time and that's it and what uh, one reason you do this is you collect for example uh data on vision at, uh, among uh, university students and compare them and compare uh, vision on some whatever vision task to 60 year olds so you collect that data one time from those two groups those two age groups and then you compare a performance on that vision test, a hypothetical vision test, and then you can draw theoretically uh, di- um, kind of conclusions about um, the impact of age on vision development. So say the 20 year olds perform better on the vision test than the 60 year olds, you say uh, the experimenters would, would conclude that uh, age is detrimental to vision and that and that's uh, and then kind of infer kind of a universal uh, developmental pro- um, uh, trajectory of vision across uh, across all humans because we found a difference between the 60-year-olds and 20-year-olds. But however, uh, this is prone to a cohort effect. So imagine another study where we measure um, the ability to browse the internet among 20-year-olds and 100-year-olds. Well, we can conclude, and, and say the study finds that 20-year-olds are better at browsing the internet than 100-year-olds. Well, we can conclude, conclude that at 100 years old, or the older you get, the worse you are at browsing the internet. But also, uh, you have to keep in mind this idea of a cohort effect. That is, because individuals are born into a particular generation, they may have been exposed to different envir- environments. So growing up, a 20-year-old was exposed to the internet basically their entire life, versus a 100-year-old who wasn't exposed uh, to the internet until 10 years ago. So that historical uh, difference in development um, can contribute to something known as a cohort effect, wherein we're attributing 
um, differences in internet usage or internet uh, capability or internet browsing capabilities between 20 and 100 year olds to this universal developmental process. But really what we're seeing possibly is this cohort effect wherein the 20 year olds had a whole life of internet exposure where the 100 year olds did not. And thus when those 20 year olds eventually become 100 year olds, uh, you would expect to see different capabilities and technological uh, uh, capabilities of browsing the, whatever the internet looks like 80 years from now. Thus, cohort effects are one uh, kind of limitation in uh, cross-sectional uh, research. So the strengths and limitations, as I stated, cohort effects are, co are uh, confounded. Uh, it also focuses on changes between groups, inter, not change within groups, uh, intra, change uh, researchers learn nothing about how people change with age. However, it's quicker, cheaper than longitudinal studies. So kind of the idea here, because it's a group comparison, you're looking at differences between groups not change within a group. You're not collecting data on those participants multiple times to, to uh, analyze their individual developmental trajectories on internet usage or whatever, cap whatever vision capabilities, but rather you're collecting that data one time and then you're comparing. It's intergroup comparison. And why this is done so often is because it's very quick and it's very cheap compared to uh, longitudinal studies. And it's still, and it does produce valuable information in fairness. Uh, Next, longitudinal studies. Uh, the longitudinal studies are when one cohort of individuals is assessed repeatedly over time. It, tr it traces uh, changes in individuals as they age. A study may start with a group of people aged 35 to 44 asking how much effort they devote to their health. 10 years later, the same group would answer the same question then again in another 10 years. It's focused on intra, not interchange, provides information about age change rather than age differences. So kind of the idea here is that in longitudinal studies, you have a group of participants and you follow them throughout their age. So you can do that every five years, 10 years. Basically, you call them, uh, you have your uh, uh, re, uh, participants, you collect data on them, and then you say, okay, five years from now, we're going to contact you and you come back into the lab. And then we measure that exact same, uh, whatever whatever we measured at one point in time, we measure that's those same exact things. And the next at the next point of time that the participants come into the lab, and then at the next time, next time, and next time. And basically, the idea here is that you have the, uh, the these participants taking the same tasks at multiple points in their life, and then you can, can uh, track the change within an individual throughout their life. So you're really focusing on intra uh, individual change. It's uh, rather than comparing uh, age differences. You're, you're interested in how people change throughout their uh, developmental trajectory. So this chart here is a pretty good uh, illustration here. So you can see in the green line here, you have the average trajectory of an individual's development um, of on this, uh, whatever, the, whatever this task is. But you have basically uh, three lines here, one with a parent having a college degree, one, uh, one line, which is the, I guess, gold line uh, with both parents having no college degree, and then you have an average trajectory. And you can see here a difference. You collect data on these individuals uh, within this one specific group, that is um, uh, individuals who have at least one parent with a college degree. Then you collect uh, data on individuals whose neither parents have a college degree, and you, tr and you collect that same data at multiple points in your life. And then you can uh, follow that developmental trajectory, create an average trajectory, and then you can see how uh, that environmental factor, aka one parent having a college degree, impacts uh, uh, differences between those two groups. So you can you can track in, intra change, and then with that in, based on that intra change um, within that kind of cohort of, of individuals having at least one parent uh, having a college degree versus parents having no college degrees, you then can compare kind of developmental trajectories of those two groups and then also produce an average trajectory across the lifespan. Looking at the strengths and limitations of longitudinal studies, the strength is that it can indicate whether the characteristics and behaviors measured remain constant over time. And you can use it to uh, answer questions such as, can early life experience predict later life behaviors? Limitations, age effects and time of measurements effects are confounded. So the COVID happened between your data collection points takes a lot of time, costs a lot of money, requires a large lab usually. Measurement methods that seem good at the start of the study may seem dated by the end. The participant retention rates, uh, attrition, and testing effects. So as stated, kind of a quick review here, um, you can, uh, you can uh, track 
uh, individ, uh, developmental outcomes across a lifespan. So for example, uh, I don't know, problem solving. You can measure uh, problem solving abilities across a lifespan and you can see, oh, are these ability, uh, is an individual's problem solving abilities kind of stable across a lifespan? Some uh, limitations in, in, include uh, time of measurement effects and age effects. So kind of the idea here is, again, kind of uh, thinking about collecting data every five years, for example. Well, what happens is some historical changing environmental factor happens, such as COVID. Well, now you've introduced, now, or well, you didn't introduce it, but kind of a environmental factor, this new kind of adverse, adversity has been introduced in the environment and which may have uh, impacted or probably did impact the quote unquote typical uh, developmental trajectory. So you have to keep in mind that, that during these uh, multiple data collection points that the environment is shifting the entire time. It's not like static. Uh, also, it takes a lot of money. It takes a lot of time. As stated, you know, you're collecting data every five, 10, whatever, one year for 30, 40, 50 years. I mean, some studies go for 100 years. Um, measurement uh, methods uh, seem good at start, but then seem data at the end. So kind of the idea here is that constantly psychologists are critiquing tasks and measurements and coming up with new ones and saying, okay, this sucks. I want to change it like this, or I want to do something a little different. Thus, what, what could have been uh, thought of as a great uh, measurement of problem solving skills in the beginning, you know, in 1950 might be completely different by 2020. Retention rate problems. So obviously as individuals, uh, age, uh, they die or they move and you can't, you can't have those individuals come back to the lab to measure them, uh, which means that uh, every year or every time you collect data, X amount of percentage of your participants are dropping out. And in general, the people who drop out are the individuals who have kind of the worst and most challenging uh, developmental uh, outcomes and the most challenging uh, uh, environmental conditions. So are you, then the question becomes, um, are, is your data kind of biased because, or your results biased because the individuals who are most experiencing the most adversity are dropping out of the study. So therefore you're not kind of collecting data on, you're collecting data on like the most, uh, well-performing individuals, or at least the, uh, compared to their, uh, the other people within that experimental group, because the, uh, people who have the most hardship are going to, are more likely to drop out of the study. And then testing effects. So the idea here is if you take the same test over and over and over again, is an individual actually improving with age or are they just used to taking the same test over and over again and have just kind of mastered the test uh, through time, through that re re uh, repetitive uh, testing procedure. And you can see this was, it's things like SAT, ACT, GRE. I took a GRE test multiple times and each time I performed better. And a few of the times I didn't even study difference. I just got used to taking the test and then I performed better. And finally, our last research uh, design uh, type that I wanna look at is, is sequential design. This combines the cross-sectional approach and a longitudinal approach in a single study. It can reveal which age-related trends are developmental in nature, which age trends differ by cohort and time of measurement effects. Very difficult and a lot of money. So kind of the idea here is that you're collecting, like longitudinal studies, you're collecting data on the same groups of participants at different time points, but at the same time, you're bringing in new cohorts into the study every X amount of years. So you're collecting data on basically cohort effects and on inter uh, individual kind of intro change. So you can see this here, cohort A, B, and C. You have your first cohort collected at 2010. Then your next cohort in 2040, uh, you bring, or sorry, at, at the next time point that you collect data at 2040, you have cohort A come in, but also you recruit a new cohort B that is the same age as the original like 2010 study. So you're bringing in multiple cohorts uh, every 30 years. So you're collecting cohort effects and you're also following multiple cohorts across their lifespan. Now, obviously, this is incredibly difficult uh, statistics to perform, frankly. And also, it is a ton of money and a ton of time. Like, this is literally like a hundred year study. Um, so, th thus, why this is uh, uh, more rare than the other studies. Or, I should say, uh, more rare than the other types of uh, research designs. Okay, moving on to specific types of uh, uh, measuring techniques. Um, or 
really kind of techniques and measurements. Uh, personal interview, a research method in which the experimenter meets with the participants and gathers data uh, directly, often through open-ended and follow-up questions, social desirability, uh, survey questionnaire, written form that participants can fill out on their own consisting of structure or focus uh, questions, uh, large-scale, less expensive, quicker, hard-to-make questions, standardized tests, established instruments that measure a specific trait or behavior, often cost money and may, may not uh, be standardized for cross-cultural populations. So kind of we have three measures that are types of uh, measures that I want to talk about here. And as stated, personal interview, this is kind of straightforward, sounds what it sounds like is what it is. You're interviewing someone, you're giving them open-ended questions. Uh, tell me about your life. How do you feel about X? Can you explain why? Um, and then you uh, ask follow-up questions. And then you collect that data and then you analyze that data. Uh, one limitation of this format is social desirability. So you ask, so this means that, um, for example, that uh, you're collecting uh, data on drug use or maybe uh, uh, promiscuous behavior or something along those lines um, in a set of just say religious, uh, I don't know, Catholic high schoolers or something along those lines. Um, uh, there's a potential bias in this data collection because the participants may respond in a way that they believe that the part that the researcher wants them to respond. So, the, so they'll imagine the researcher wanting them to say that, oh, I don't, they want me to not do drugs. So I'm going to kind of lie and say that I don't abuse drugs or I don't, uh, engage in promiscuous uh, sexual behavior, for example. And then thus I can uh, bias the data because it's, they're answering in a way, the participants are answering in a way that um, conforms to their belief uh, in what the researcher wants to hear. Then we have the survey questions, which you're just, uh, you know, you can take these online in general. Uh, you can perform large scale studies of this. You can either mail it out or just post your survey online, have people fill it out. So it's, you can do large scale studies. It's, it's, it's quick, it's less expensive. However, it's often to make questions. It is very difficult to make uh, survey questions or test questions in general. And people spend years refining questions and there's always debate on it. Uh, and then you have standardized tests, which um, are uh, standardized and thus you have a set of questions that everyone's using. Questions are kind of decided for you, but uh, you those cost money. And uh, often the standardization process is, um, is, is um, very um, uh, weird. Um, that is uh, Western educated, industrial, uh, rich and democratic from those kind of countries, those traditional Western or global North countries. Uh, so thus they may not be standardized for cross-cultural uh, context. So poor countries and, you know, X, uh, X continent or X, uh, Y uh, country. And thus, uh, they cannot be used in those countries until they are standardized. Next, I want to discuss uh, data analysis. So the most common ways uh, that um, researchers look at adult development are through comparison of means, correlational analysis, and meta-analysis. Beginning with comparison of means, this is a statistical analysis that allows researchers to determine whether the difference in measurement taking on two groups are large enough to be considered statistically significant, possible to compare subgroups. There are uh, three types cross-sectional studies, and we've already reviewed these, means of age groups are compared, longitudinal means of scores for the same people at different ages are compared, and sequential, both comparisons are possible. So this is the kind of uh, uh, using, a, a, um, or I should say collecting data as stated on individuals, and then kind of producing like a mean, and then doing the statistical analysis to see if those means are statistically different from each other. Uh, you've probably seen something like p equals or p is less than 0.05 and if it's less than 0.05 then those means are stati statistically uh, uh, different from each other um, granted there's a whole critique of, of p being less than 0.05 being a valid measure or not and I'll, i will spare you all but that's kind of the point here comparisons of means correlational studies uh, they determine whether two or more variables are related in a systematic way there's no random assignment or manipulations of IV, and it produces a correlation coefficient. It is an index of the strength of the, of the relationship between two variables of interest, and it ranges from positive one to negative one. So kind of the idea here is that individuals within a, uh, within a research study are not randomly assigned to a specific group. 
And this is kind of most research. So for example, uh, comparing uh, individuals who um, who dropped out of high school, for example, D comparing, uh, so having two groups, individuals dropped out of high school and individuals who didn't, and then comparing their, um, uh, I don't know, self-esteem at 40 years old, for example. There's no random assignment, which means that experimenters did not say, okay, you, you group of kids over there, you drop out of high school, and you group of kids over here, you're not going to drop out of high school, and then we're going to follow you. That's not what they do. Or, for example, I look at like natural disasters and war, so I don't say, okay, Florida uh, or whatever, um, uh, Georgia, Florida, you're going to get hit with a hurricane. Uh, South Carolina, you're not, okay? So I'm going to get a hurricane, I'm going to hit you with it, and then you guys aren't. That's There's no... Uh, uh, I'm not uh, creating those groups and I'm not, I'm not randomly assigning those people to the group. So I'm not drawing them out of a hat and saying, okay, you're in the, hur get hit with the hurricane group and you're not in the, uh, and you're in the not hitting the hurricane group. So the researcher is not randomly assigning these groups. These are groups that are, that are occurring in the natural real world, uh, free of experimental manipulation. Thus, you have way less experimental control and you aren't able really to come away with causal conclusions because you as an experimenter are not sitting in a lab and saying oh, like okay you i'm drawing you out of the hat and i'm gonna and i'm gonna i'm gonna honey i shrunk the kids you both of you and i'm gonna hit you with a hurricane like it's sim city or something along those lines it's random assignment thus it's i cannot and thus you have all these other background factors your entire life that we can't rule out and thus, I, it's you. You, I'm sure, have heard that correlation does not equal causation. So we um, we cannot say for sure that something is proven or caused by something because there's no random assignment or manipulation of the IV. In that case, the manipulation of experiencing a hurricane, the manipulation of dropping out of high school, the experimenter is not manipulating that IV. IV being the independent variable, which is the predictor variable. Um, and again, kind of the dot to be the, the experiment, the, the, the variable that the experiment manipulates versus a dependent variable, the DV, which is your outcome variable um, or your, yeah, your kind of your dependent variable or your outcome variable. So in that case, again, kind of going back to the high school example, the IVs being uh, the, did you drop out of high school or not? And then uh, uh, at 40 years old, their, uh, whatever I said, self-esteem. That's their DV. So it's the outcome. It's dependent on the IV or exposure to a hurricane and, um, I don't know, a future um, uh, income salary or, or income. Um, so the DV is income and the IV is exposure to hurricane. Okay. And because, again, there's no random assignment and there's no manipulation of the hurricane or school dropout, it is uh, kind of not experimental and we can only draw correlational um, uh, interpretations of the results. And anyway, so once you conduct that correlational analysis, it spits out a number and it ranges from plus one to minus one, plus one being a perfect positive correlation that is um, a very strong high positive correlation versus a, a negative one, which is a very strong negative correlation. And, and um, one easy example of this is, is a child born underweight um, a child who's born underweight associated with uh, behavioral problems in preschool. So is being uh, born underweight as a child um, or neonatal, neonatal uh, kind of underweight, being, being born low birth weight, is that associated with problem behaviors in preschool? So in that case, um, being born underweight is your IV and problem behaviors are um, your dependent variable. Now this is all just made up data. I made this um, in some stat program, but kind of in the upper left-hand corner, you can see a negative correlation here between birth weight and problem behaviors in pre-K. And this would be a um, um, negative one, uh, a negative correlation R equals negative one. And that's the magic of editing right there. So kind of the idea here is that as one variable increases, the other variable decreases. That's why it's negative. So in this case, as um, uh, your um, your uh, birth weight increases, your problem behaviors decrease. Okay, so you have one going one way, one going the other way, and in this case, it's a perfect negative one correlation. That means it's super strong. Then in the bottom left-hand corner, we have the opposite. We have a positive correlation. R equals one. So in that case, we have two positive. 
uh, kind of trajectories here of our IV and DV. So in this case, birth weight goes up and problem behaviors go up, that, which would be represented by R equals one. And then on the right-hand side, we have R equals zero, which is kind of like there is no correlation. So there is no correlation between birth weight and um, uh, pre-K problem behaviors. Now, in the real world, there is never R equals one or R equals negative one. There's always some number, it's always a little bit low. So for example, R equals 0.2, R equals 0 0.3, 0 0.5, whatever. And then there's kind of just some social conventions on describing, is this a strong positive correlation or a moderate positive correlation or a low positive correlation and vice versa for negative? Because there is no one variable in life that kind of predicts everything. Because as we stated, development is complicated and influenced by many factors. Thus, your R's are always going to be less than um, or more than uh, one or negative one. So we already talked about some of the limitations of correlations, um, but here are a couple more directionality problems. So it's the direction of the cause and effect relationship could be reversed. Uh, third variable problem, the association between three, two variables of interest may be caused by some third uh, variable and cannot establish a causal relationship between one variable and another. So for example, you can uh, imagine a child being really annoying, having really problem behaviors, and, and, and then also a parent having bad parenting behaviors. Um, so the question becomes a just directionality problem. So what is, what is actually causing this correlation? Is it the parent uh, being incredibly annoying uh, or a bad parent and thus contributing to the development of annoying behaviors in their child? Or is the child so annoying that the parent is like, dude, I'm tired of this kid. Um, I'm not, I'm going to be a bad parent. I don't care. It's not worth it. Well, probably it's likely it's probably both interacting with each other, but kind of the point here is, is the directionality of the correlation. What is actually, which of these two variables are actually causing, uh, this relationship? And we can't know that through the correlation. There's also a problem with a third problem. So maybe it's some third variable. Maybe it's um, income. Maybe it's some uh, uh, some issues with at, at, uh, the parent's job. Or maybe the child, um, I don't know, gets bullied at school or something along those lines. So maybe it's some third variable that's not measured in that correlation that's actually driving that close relationship between a child being annoying and bad parenting. And as I stated, you cannot uh, establish causal relationships between one variable and, and another in correlation studies. Next, meta-analysis. And this hopes, and this is kind of an attempt to kind of address a replication crisis, which is kind of like, of the majority of studies are not able to be re replicated. So basically, if you do this, the same study multiple times, um, the results will be different. Um, and this could be due to a whole host of reasons that range from experimental era, error in research design, maybe cross-cultural differences, some variables that aren't measured, or uh, maybe historical changes, um, uh, maybe different cohorts that are, are, are different, uh, I don't know, genders or races that are collected within a study, different cross-cultural uh, environmental differences, so measuring this, administering the same exact study in one country versus another, or just kind of open fraud. But uh, the point is the meta-analysis is kind of uh, thought to kind of... Um, hopefully address kind of this replication crisis which in, within psychology, but also kind of exists across multiple fields. Um, and meta-analysis is defined as, uh, or kind of the approach here is that the results of multiple studies uh, addressing the same question are synthesized to produce overall conclusions, aid in the confidence of research findings. So basically what this, do, what this type of study does is they look at other researchers' research, research's findings and then combine it into this new mega prod, in this new mega one study. So they'll look at, for example, um, uh, studies on uh, whatever, child behavior problems and uh, poverty or whatever. Uh, they'll link between poverty and child behavior problems. And they'll just look at basically kind of similar studies uh, measuring those two variables, and they'll, they'll take all those results, all that data, and throw it into one mega, basically one mega analysis. And those uh, meta-analysis can include, you know, anywhere from 10 to 1,000 studies data combined, depending on how many studies are on that topic. So kind of one example here is birth weight and uh, mortality, a systematic review and meta-analysis. So the idea here is birth weight uh, linked to early mortality. And we can see in the uh, methods, um, the um, 
uh, just kind of highlighting in red here, uh, we reviewed 22 studies. So they collected data on 22 studies. And then they have the uh, conclusion there is an inverse but moderate association. Inverse means negative. So a negative uh, correlation, it's another term for association. So a moderate negative correlation. Um, and uh, men, for men, higher birth weight was associated, strongly associated with increased risk of cancer death. So here we kind of really see what we just covered. So they, they collected uh, data on 22 studies, and these are 22 studies that they did not perform. They, they went to other people's data. Often researchers will just email you and ask you for your data, and they combined it all and they did this research, and then they found an inverse relationship, aka negative uh, correlation uh, between uh, birth weight and adult uh, mortality. So again, a negative correlation being as um, uh, uh, birth weights, um, as birth, or I should say, as, as birth weight increases, uh, the risk of mortality decreases. So, so again, kind of immediately connecting back to our uh, our previous slides. But that's kind of the idea here. And then I just kind of uh, created some fictional data here to give you a visual representation of that negative correlation. Moving on to experimental methods, there are three critical features of experimental methods. There's random assignment of participants to, to different experimental conditions, manipulation of the IV, and experimental control. High amount of control can control other variables in a control group. The strengths of the experimental method can infer the one thing causes another, increase understanding of human development, limitation, generalizability to the real world, and sometimes impossible to conduct or unethical. And we talked about this really kind of in the previous slide. So kind of the idea here is that the experimenter is, uh, has high amount of control. They can control uh, all the variables that an individual is exposed to. And thus, through this high level of experimental control, it can actually infer um, and increase the understanding of development through kind of causal relationships. Because I'm directly uh, placing someone in one uh, experimental condition and not another. I have a control group and I'm manipulating an IV. So you often kind of see this in uh, treatment studies. So, so for example, uh, someone with uh, heart disease or something, uh, having one group of with heart disease uh, get no treatment, uh, another group of heart disease get uh, medication, and then another group of, of uh, people with heart disease having medication and, I don't know, mindfulness training or something along that lines. And then comparing the... Um, their um, their health, you know, five years later. So that's a high degree of manipulation. You have an experimental control, um, and you're manipulating the IV in that case. IV being treatment. Either you get no treatment, uh, you get medication, or you get medication and uh, mindfulness training. Now, some limitations on that is generalizability to the real world, uh, and sometimes impossible to conduct or or unethical. So kind of the idea of that. Um, uh, that uh, uh, treatment study, it's, uh, it's generally um, un believed to be unethical to give an individual no treatment. So you have to give them some treatment or, um, you know, because you know that person's going to die. So say they have a terminal illness, for example. You can't assign them to the no treatment group because you're going to literally kill your experimenter. So instead, you um, have to give them some treatment. So usually what happens is you give one group who has a terminal condition some a conventional treatment and then you give another group conventional plus this a new other treatment now that's not as tightly controlled and experimental but you know we, in, in general we don't want to kill our participants um, because it's unethical next I want to briefly review quasi experimental design so this is quasi experimental so there are group differences so in my case for example when I looked at uh, mothers in the Congo exposed to a uh, um, a military occupation, I couldn't say, okay, I'm not going to go pay some, you know, rebel group to military occupy a city. Um, thus, I can't like, have a, uh, you know, that level of control. However, I do, had, I did have two different groups because I collected data on mothers who were exposed to this military occupation and mothers who weren't exposed to that military occupation. However, that was not systematically done. Those were just two groups that naturally formed uh, within um, the uh, real world. I also did not randomly assign them to those groups, and um, I did uh, not have, again, control of those extraneous uh, variables uh, that existed within those um, two groups. Those groups just kind of naturally forms. So that's kind of what the idea here is quasi-experimental design. So kind of groups, are, there are groups, but uh, kind of the degree of control are far more limited. And that's usually how it works in the real world because 
we don't <laughs> we can't take a child and just put them in a lab their entire life and then expose them to x and y z variables to you know try and figure out universal development next looking at descriptive and qualitative research descriptive uh, research is a type of data gathering that defines the current state of participants on some measure of intent there's little experimental control rate of diabetes in 2019 qualitative research um, include case studies interviews participant observations direct observation exploring documents artifacts archival records it involves uh, extra extrapolating evidence from for a theory uh, from what people say or write detailed uh, information about participants from what people say or write versus quantitative research which is research with numerical data inferring evidence of a theory through measurement of variables that produce numerical outcomes so kind of descriptive research kind of being here kind of in other words is um, kind of just distraught describing kind of in the word this kind of the state of the of, of an individual there's actually it's called descriptive statistics um you're, so that can just include you know uh, uh within a population how many people have diabetes or how many males or females what are the racial composition of a city something along those lines just pure description you're really not you're not manipulating data anyway you're just kind of looking at what the rates of whatever measure are qualitative research uh, deals with case studies interviews so kind of the idea here is you're quite collecting um, and observing and exploring kind of data that's uh, qualitative in nature so in a nun study which we'll cover more in uh, f uh, future chapters researchers basically found uh, journals of nuns and they journaled for decades basically and what researchers did is they looked at the nuns journals and kind of just calculated how many types of of adjectives adverbs kind of the complexity of words used and then compare uh the, the kind of the complexity of words used to their uh, likelihood of uh, various uh physical health disorders mental health disorders and long and uh, lifespan so kind of looking at this qualitative data and then comparing it to in that case a physical health outcome and that qualitative data in that case being the complexity of words versus quantitative data so with numerical data so and this is like a you can uh, administer a task to an individual and that and you get a percentage of how well that individual did on that task and then try and do a correlation of the performance on that task with whatever so performance on a, uh, a uh, impulse control task get a percentage of how well they did on that task and then do a correlation between percentage of how well they did on that impulse task and um substance abuse rates do they report that they abuse i don't know cocaine or something along those lines and then do a correlation now i want to skip ahead a little bit kind of just to wrap this up and talk about weird weird being western educated industrial rich and democratic countries and why weird matters americans make up 68 percent of uh, psychological uh participants a full 96% of psychology participants are from Western industrialized countries. But weird countries only make up 16% of the world's population. 70% of participants of psychology um, uh, studies are undergraduates. It supports the argument that general psychology does not concern itself with context or content is the fact that psychology has adopted a sampling methodology that largely ignores the questions about generalizability of its findings. The extreme narrow samples most psychologists use make good sense if the mind operates exclusively according to universal laws. So kind of the idea here is, is that uh, as stated, the majority of studies are from these weird contexts. And then the question is, um, and what, what psychologists try to do, and, and historically that is, is really focus on this very small, narrow context of people that make up a micro percentage of the world, but a super majority of research uh, participants, and then draw these universal claims across historical era, across cross-cultural claims. Um, um, so uh, draw kind of like these universal developmental processes based on these limited participants. And as kind of we discussed, uh, and argued by Broff and Brenner, and really kind of the replication crisis. Um, this is not valid. And researchers have now kind of uh, understood this and have begun to collect more data on cross cultural studies. And why, in this class, I'm going to, in our discussions, really focus on uh, populations, uh, uh, adulthood populations that are 
that are classically um, um, underrepresented in research studies. And as stated, two thirds of research published in American psych journals were American, despite 95% of the world not US citizens. The question then is how generalizable, how generalizable are um, uh, psychology's findings? Cross-cultural research requires procedures are meaningful in each culture. It means the same thing across different subcultures. Translations are task culturally relevant and work to keep their cultural values from biasing their perceptions. Differences within groups different for sufficient. So kind of the idea here is that these <laughs> one reason why uh, the researchers don't engage in cross-cultural studies is that it's you know kind of difficult. You have to translate something. You have to back translate some something. Anyone who speaks two languages or has done cross-cultural research understands that just because you uh, you have to tr translate and back translate things because um, meaning across the language, words and phrases across language are not directly comparable. So you have to translate something and then back translate it to see if um, back to the original language. So English, so I had to do English to Swahili. Uh, we, so we, we translated our English measures to Swahili and then have our Swahili bilingual uh, speakers translate it back to English. And then I would read it and see if it still made sense or still tried to, or still was, um, the questions were still kind of getting at what I was trying to measure. And that is a long process and difficult. Also, the uh, uh, potential problem is tasks. Are, uh, so in the Congo, are the tasks that, that I was administering, are those toys unique to Western um, uh, children or, adult, or, um, or items that are unique to uh, Western uh, adults? And thus an individual may not have uh, experience interacting with those toys or those items, and thus I'm kind of culturally biasing my sample, which kind of ultimately uh, kind of leads to this different versus efficient uh, and recognizing that some abilities are going to be more valued in one culture than another, one cultural context, one environmental context than the other. So it's important to understand difference does not necessarily mean uh, deficient. The importance of culture and psychology is important to note that culture influences everyone, including us. Our thoughts, our behaviors appear natural to us because we really don't know how we could think and behave otherwise. We are socialized to think that particular ways of doing things are good and moral, usually the ways that are common within our own culture. We uh, recognize our own uh, ethnocentric ethnocentrism, judging other cultures by comparing them to our culture, using our own culture as a standard of comparison. Students who learn about psychology in or learn about culture and psychology courses showing an overall increase in cultural awareness and cultural intelligence, which improves intercultural understanding. So kind of idea here with this little uh, cartoon here is that because you live in this environment and you look around and everybody kind of acts like you, talks like you, thinks like you, or, you know, you know more or less, you know, within a range, obviously, um, uh, you uh, individuals come to often the incorrect conclusion that this is a universal way of seeing the world um, because, you know, that's, your environment, that's your mistake. In this case, that's your fish tank. Um, um, however, you know, that's, you have to uh, systematically uh, examine those research across cultures to identify kind of um, the degree of universal uh, developmental trajectories and how also how the environment impacts different developmental outcomes. And as stated, research uh, in, uh, uh, indicates that kind of including cultural elements within psychology courses uh, increases cultural awareness and intelligence. Thus, I will be including them in our course. All right, so that was kind of long. Um, so um, moving forward, it'll be a little shorter, but kind of this week we only had one lecture. So I was like, yeah, we're going to push it a little bit. And this is really kind of foundational to our course. So thank you so much for listening. Uh, I hope you have a great day and uh, I'll see you next week. Thanks. Bye.